Hello, welcome to a slightly different episode of the Science for Policy podcast. My name is Toby, and today what you're about to hear is the recording of a conversation between 12 different people. Uh, the conversation took place as part of a big conference organised a couple of weeks ago by the International Network for Government Science Advice. And the people you're about to hear, as I say, 12, well, 13 if you count the moderator, um, were brought together by SAPEA and the European Commission, both their Joint Research Centre and the group of chief scientific advisors, to discuss the topic of epistemic diversity, um, i.e. the challenges of incorporating many different perspectives in science advice. I didn't originally intend to include this conversation on the podcast, but as I was listening to the discussion, it's so full of really interesting and often often quite uh, original contributions from the speakers. I kept thinking, oh, wow, that would make a great topic for an episode. And after thinking that for about the 15th time, I just thought, OK, why not publish the whole conversation as a podcast episode in its own right? So here it is. Um, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. And of course... I might still approach some of the guests to ask them if they'd like to elaborate a bit more on some of their ideas in future one-to-one -one regular episodes. There's certainly no point in my uh, reeling off the names of all the people who are part of the conversation because they drop in and out uh, and there's no way you'll remember them all. But Estelle, who's the moderator, does a good job of introducing each person when they contribute. And I'll put the full list in the show notes for this episode so you can find out who's who. One other thing, you'll appreciate that the audio quality varies considerably between the different speakers because it was recorded from a live event. Um, I've done my best with a bit of editing and cleaning up here and there, but honestly, you can tell you're listening to a Zoom recording. Um, if that kind of thing annoys you, then I apologize. Finally, if you want to watch the original unedited video of the event, which also includes some opening and closing remarks, uh, and it goes without saying a range of very handsome faces, then you can find the video online on the Sapea website, sapea.info slash epistemic hyphen diversity. Um, anyway, I'll put that link also in the show notes. Okay, enjoy the conversation. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, my name is Estelle Valiant. I will be the moderator for this satellite session of the INSA conference. The theme is Science Advice for Energy Policy. Who is afraid of epistemic diversity? And um, this is co-organized by the European Commission uh, Joint Research Center, the group of chief scientific advisors, and the scientific advice for policy from the European Academies. We have a special format for you, a fishbowl conversation, bringing together some uh, panelists, but also some audience members who will be able to join uh, the conversation. So our triggering question for this first part of the fishbowl is really uh, about some success stories of bringing together for complex uh, policy uh, questions, bringing to, together some different disciplines and some different perspectives. How can this work? What were the surprising outcomes or what were uh, maybe some other lessons learned you, you can bring uh, on the table? So uh, for this first part, I'm going to ask uh, some of our panelists to bring forward some of these, uh, their experiences. So may I kindly ask uh, Jacopo Toriti to turn on his webcam. He is a professor. Jacopo, you're a professor of energy economics and policy uh, at the School of the Built Environment in the University of Reading. Um, I would like also to ask uh, Jenny Stephens to join me. Uh, and Jacopo. So uh, Ginny is, uh, is uh, joining us from Northeastern University. She is the director of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs and the Dean Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy. Uh, may I also kindly ask uh, Tula Thierry to uh, join me. Uh, so Tula is the uh, chair of uh, Eurocase and she might introduce a little bit on this uh, aspect as well and the president of the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. Thanks for joining, Tula. Um, I will also ask uh, Diana, uh, Diana Yrke Borsax, to join me for this first part. Uh, Diana is a professor at the Department of Environmental Sciences and Policy, Central European University, and she's a member of the IPCC and a member of the uh, SAPEA Energy Working Group. Thanks for joining, Diana. 
So let's start the conversation. Uh, I know uh, maybe Jacopo, do you want to have a quick intervention on some success story? And then I'll, I'll ask uh, maybe Tula and uh, Jenny and Diana to follow up. Thank you, Estelle. Um, I think mine is a success story provided that you define uh, success as uh, challenging policymakers and uh, monodisciplinary thinking. So um, I'm on Ofgem's uh, academic panel. Uh, I've been for, for a few years and I thought of something that happened recently um, and, uh, uh, and a success based on causing reflection, causing um, being a critical thinker around uh, other uh, disciplinary approaches which have not been undertaken on a specific uh, uh, piece of analysis or work. So uh, I was uh, peer reviewing um, work on um, demand side uh, flexibility and uh, there were assumptions which uh, like uh, many around energy demand were heavily based on behavior and uh, on price and technology being able to change behavior of individuals um, and uh, because the piece was around uh, um, energy demand uh, and flexibility uh, I was uh, suggesting to bring in a more uh, different disciplinary approach, um, including uh, social practices and, and the timing of energy demand, and there's a, a whole literature around that. Now, if you may say, okay, I caused some headaches because the, the whole piece was stopped and uh, caused reflection and, and, you know, taking a few months off, off the gas uh, for, for the regulator to now rethink about it. Um, I think it's, it's, just, it's just I wanted to kick off with this example because it's not the typical uh, um, or oh, we feed in some numbers which are needed, uh, like kind of low hanging fruit is a bit more of a major rethink. So it really depends on how it defines success. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I thought my short story would, would be around this. Thanks a lot, Jacopo, on, on this idea of challenging the, the monodisciplinary uh, approach. And, and that might bring headaches, but that's also bringing some new views and some, some catalyzer. Any of the other panelists would like to either react to that or add? OK, so Tula, do you want to add more on this question of how do you bring together those different disciplines? What are the surprising outcomes we can get or some lessons learned you had? My perspective is that of engineering. And um, uh, we have a, one example, you know, which is very illustrative of how science advice can contribute to policy. It's a uh, broad energy agreement in Sweden, 2019, which was actually shared by the majority of the political parties in Sweden. And it was to a large extent based on a project by the Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, EVA. Uh, EVA was founded about 100 years ago, and we have had many, many subjects uh, on our agenda, but energy has been on our agenda all of the time uh, for 100 years. So the solid fact base for this uh, energy agreement came from a project that we run uh, all together with 16 different reports uh, uh, looking into the different aspects of, of energy, energy production and consumption in Sweden. And so uh, what we do and what academies uh, often do is that we bring together different sectors uh, in the society, scientists, industry, public authorities and policymakers, these different perspectives that were, were mentioned before. And we could see that this energy agreement actually is something that most of the political parties were behind it. And that's why also these recommendations have been gradually implemented in practice. Mm -hmm. So the agreement was not only focusing on energy production, but also on the efficiency of energy distribution. And, and also the need of increased flexibility or adjustability of electricity market to, the, to be able to manage uh, what we foresee a mix of different sources of energy that are going to be needed mm -hmm. uh, for a complete energy system. And so, so also what we could, of course, see and what we see in all these kind of projects is that uh, it's not just technology, it's not only the opinions, but there are also regu regulatory actions which are needed uh, to accomplish these kind of uh, policy actions. And, and, and one of the things that, uh, as an example from this particular project, was that we were recommending certain adjustments in the taxation of, for example, hydropower, and these were 
uh, implemented because of this broad agreement. And, and then there are also, when, I, when I'm thinking about the national, international perspectives, one of the things that we recommended to work on in 2016, but we're still trying to solve, is how the capacity could be increased to transmit electricity across the borders in the Nordic countries. Mm -hmm. And this work uh, has taken a lot longer to solve than uh, many of the technical aspects of this, this issue. So I think this also has a bearing to the EU perspectives, which are very well mm -hmm. uh, visualized in this energy report. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the learnings that I could say, you know, in this is that, you know, these kind of agreements, they take a long time to achieve. And even with the agreement in place, uh, the implementation can't be taken for granted. I guess my message would be that uh, an, uh, this kind of an agreement needs to be revisited regularly. The, mm -hmm. the discussion needs to continue because it will not be solved by just one agreement. Thanks a lot, Tulaya. So revisiting an agreement, making sure that on the long term you have a way to always maintain the dialogue. I heard also that at the beginning how important it was to engage not just different disciplines of expertise, but also policymakers and even politicians to get them on board early in the process. Maybe something okay. also to, to keep in mind. I see from our panelists, who would like to take the floor? Diana, yes? Yes, this is a very interesting format. So uh, for my success story is uh, from uh, the SAPEA, which uh, you already kind of introduced, uh, science advice for policy by European academies. And they commissioned uh, the energy transition report, which was uh, done for the group of uh, chief scientific advisors. And that worked by selecting 20 leading academics from Europe, all around uh, Europe, from very different disciplines. And that has been extremely interesting experience. And I think by the end, we all uh, really um, identify with the, with the key, uh, with the final finance, but the road to there wasn't easy. And at the end of this short intervention, I will offer uh, some interesting uh, lessons. But um, because we don't know yet whether it will be truly successful in terms of catalyzing policy change, although I do hope it will, but I wanted to offer a short insight from more um, um, historic um, evolutionary insight from the IPCC. If you think about it originally, uh, the IPCC was mostly meteorology, even though the, it had three working groups, it was mostly all IPCC focal points were institutes of meteorological institutes in the different countries. And after we understood, yes, there is a big problem. And in fact, the problem is caused by our energy consumption, energy was brought in, and suddenly the shift also uh, went to um, the engineers. So the uh, the technological domain, because we have to have the solutions. But then by, let's say, third assessment report, and, and I joined at the fourth assessment report, so definitely by the fourth assessment report, we were very convinced that actually we already have the technologies, we can fight climate change, we can stop it, and we do have, of course, further R&D is very important, but we don't need to wait for further new technologies because actually we already do have uh, technologies to, uh, to fight climate change. So once we understood that, uh, it still didn't happen, nothing changed. So we understood, okay, perhaps the problem is the cost. Yes, people are afraid of the cost. So the fifth assessment report did a much more uh, thorough job at looking at the cost and economics of uh, climate change as well as, as, as mitigation and concluded that it is not going to cause the earth. It's not uh, going to break the bank, but still major change wasn't uh, really coming along. And I think it's when uh, in, in the sixth assessment cycle, this was first when we, we truly managed to integrate uh, social sciences and humanities. For example, in the third uh, working group, we have a separate chapter, which is on energy demand and services. And, and, and basically, well, we put a lot of social mm -hmm. science together. And, and the special report in this cycle, the one and a half degree uh, report on global warming was a truly interdisciplinary and epistemically very mm -hmm. diverse report where even the authors were very mixed, even within every single 
chapter. And I think that was perhaps one of the reasons for its major success of the report, since before that report, if somebody muttered one and a half degrees, it was still kind of, a, in the scientific community, it was kind of a tree hugger. It's not a, not a right academic, but by now we have, we see in politics that there is a major political will and we have 73% of global emissions currently already committed to, uh, to climate neutrality, even though before that it was not uh, sexy. But I think I, I want to offer two lessons. One is from the SAPEA report. It's also true, it was also true, of course, uh, in uh, IPCC, in the global energy assessment that Naki offered, I think it was perhaps less of an issue, but, but very often when very different disciplines work together, especially in the domain of energy, very often there comes um, a little bit of epistemic dignity where, yes, you listen to the other discipline, but you keep thinking, oh, this is totally wrong. They don't know anything about energy. Here is my solution. You know, you don't realize your technology won't work because my social science or vice versa. The eco economists or engineers feel, okay, we have the solution. So what are you talking about? So of course, I'm making it very extreme and polarized. But I think it is true that that a culture of more epistemic humility is really important to have uh, epistemic diversity to succeed. And my final um, conclude quickly, Diana, please. Yes, oh, is the art beyond uh, beyond just uh, different disciplines. I think it's also very important to involve art. And for example, the IPCC is working more and more with art. And I think it's uh, very good because art shows that people not only decide by knowledge but by feelings. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That's an interesting trigger maybe for some some new intervention. So I have I have Jenny and then Thomas. Thank you. Uh, great to have this opportunity to um, sh share. And I'm I'm going to the example I have is about Massachusetts, which is the state in the United States where Boston is, um, and we've been trying to be a leader on energy transformation. And um, one of the things I want to start by pointing out is that epistemic diversity requires also diversity of people who is involved in science and social science. I recently wrote a book called Diversifying Power, Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist Leadership on Climate and Energy. And one of the points in the book is that because of a lack of diversity of people, we have been focusing too much on technological innovation and not enough on social innovation. And when we don't focus on social innovation and social science, we miss the social justice implications of the policies um, and, that, and I think the lack of diversity is partly why we have been inadequate and insufficient in the urgency of the energy transformation. So um, the example that I, I, I give is here in Massachusetts, we were had very strong solar incentive policies that were based on what Diana was also talking about, the economics and the technologies available um, without very much consideration of the social implications. And so the incentives went to all wealthy households and they got solar panels with big incentives and single family homes only. And huge parts of the population were excluded from these solar policies. And the, uh, um, the benefits went uh, actually exacerbated inequities because the, the well-off households got low or free electricity uh, from their solar panels once they paid off and other households, the energy burden became even bigger. So only more recently when uh, more attention was given to social science, more inclusive policy processes that go beyond the published literature of a narrow group of experts and include more broad considerations of the scientific advice in the policy making was when we were able to uh, change this shift and recognize the importance of the social justice uh, aspects. So I think as a woman, um, I want to speak specifically about gender diversity, but also diversity of all kinds, um, race, religion, age, ableism. Um, we know that when women, people of color, marginalized groups uh, are in positions of power and are part of the decision-making process, we bring different experience, different priorities, different perceptions of risk, and that, that shapes what actually happens. So it's really important to connect scientific content with also the understanding the broader uh, conversations about who even has access to be considered a scientist um, and how we can broaden 
the role of expertise. And I'll just say, you know, as a woman working in energy for the past uh, 20 years, you know, I have gone to energy conferences where, um, you know, it's mostly all men with just a handful of women in the room, maybe 300 people and the women we notice and check in with each other. And we are thinking about some, some connections in some different ways. And I'm not making uh, broad uh, gender generalizations, but we all all have to acknowledge that based on our exp life experiences, we bring different priorities and that life experience diversity is also critical to getting more epistemic diversity for more effective energy action. Thanks a lot, Ginny, for this uh, contribution, bringing also in perspective the diversity of people that you raised and the, the link between uh, social innovation and so so social justice, which is not always visible. Uh, within the current policy discourse. Thomas, uh, if you want to contribute, we have heard a lot, I mean, some discourse also about how do you actually do it, be going beyond the epistemic diversity, even keeping in mind also the global perspective of bringing the diversity of people to change uh, perspectives. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity to share our experience. And I would like to share um, a specific uh, experience. I participated to a, an interdisciplinary uh, journey uh, initiated around 2016, 2017 by Nicola Labanca and Angela Pereira from the European Union's Joint Research Center, and which involved the perspectives of sociologists, physicists, engineers, economists, anthropologists, biologists, ecologists, and policy analysts. So very broad array of, of people. Uh, and uh, actually, actually Clark, Clark Miller also from this uh, panel session was also part of this process. And the goal was really to trigger an interdisciplinary discussion of the fundamental issues regarding uh, policies for sustainable transition to re renewable energy. So this process led to different outcomes, an, an edited book, a workshop, a webinar, a joint article in a peer-reviewed energy journal to, to really con trying to convey the, the, the main messages to researchers and policymakers. And uh, I think the process was quite, was quite su successful because even though the experts were from very different and, and multiple backgrounds and disciplines, we managed to find a common language and in this case, the, the common language was, was built around complex systems and social practices. And I think this specific epistemological methodological angle was important because complex systems and the acknowledgement that complex systems are in part uh, socially constructed, of course, um, these complex systems are inherently multifaceted. And so seen from one angle, uh, complex systems uh, appear different from uh, another angle. And so with complex uh, social technical systems, uh, many different people with different perspectives can find complementary voices to add to the discussion. So I think a complexity perspective is, is really a necessary condition for multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity. And it also, of course, enable uh, scientists and policymakers to really uh, grasp the, the the inherent complexity of of energy policy challenges. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas. Also on on the practical aspects of engaging with the reality of complex systems, which actually is helping with understanding the perspectives of uh, different uh, actors. So, Clark. Thanks. I, this has been a great conversation. I'm really enjoying it. I would offer, I think, a couple of additional points that extend some of those that we've heard recently. Uh, the first is I would say that, you know, one of the challenges that we really face in this space is that these transitions that we're talking about in order to achieve carbon neutrality are not just technological change, they're really uh, economic and social transformations uh, at the same time. And I think that really demands that we open up the array of uh, epistemic diversity that we see in our scientific advisory processes and really in some ways, uh, I think need to be much more ambitious about making these not just panels about 
energy transitions, but really panels about people-centered uh, transitions. And I'm really impressed with the International Energy Agency's new uh, People-Centered uh, Energy Transition Commission as a model for thinking about this. If you think back to the automobile and, and electricity, when we brought them in, we transformed society and we transformed whole economies. And that's what's happening again. And we really need that fully integrated perspective in order to understand the full dimensions of these transitions. As Jenny was saying, I think the second point I would make is that we need this integrated expert advice to go much deeper than it has uh, thus far. It's one thing to bring it in at the very top level with respect to advising legislative or ministerial decision-making. But the reality is, as we undergo this transition over the next several decades, we're talking about regulatory decision-making, we're talking about uh, energy strategy at the level of firms, electric utilities, uh, cities, uh, countries. We're talking about, uh, you know, we need it down at the level of grid redesign and transportation redesign, and ultimately, we need it at the level of technology innovation to have this kind of integrated perspective uh, and this epistemic diversity in our expert advice go all the way down. Because uh, if it doesn't go all the way down, then we, then we miss key pieces of the puzzle. Um, and we end up in situations where we begin to lose, uh, for example, public support for the transition as we go through it. And then the, the final point I'll make is that you know, what we're increasingly aware of is that the decisions that we're making are not just about building a new kind of energy system that's carbon neutral. They're really about building different kinds of futures. And we have real choices about which kinds of futures uh, we want. And we've been involved in some really interesting experiences of late bringing together fiction writers, artists, cultural creatives and others, uh, as well as uh, members of the public to imagine different kinds of energy futures that might be possible if we make different choices about which kinds of carbon neutrality technologies and approaches to follow uh, and so forth. So uh, thanks. Thanks Clark also for opening on these ideas of uh, how do you also forecast in different ways, including involving artists. I think we had Diana also bringing this idea that arts are also a way to, in to bring in perspectives that are not usually done. Uh, we have with us uh, an audience member. So Tula, if you agree, I will first give the floor to uh, our uh, participants and then back to you. So um, Alex, give your intervention. I thank you very much for uh, taking the chance to join the conversation from the audience. Well, hi, I'm, I'm Alex. I work at the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of Warwick at the moment and also collaborate with the Global Research Network. And I work on issues of uh, bioeconomy and sustainability. And um, I, I also wanted to add to this last conversation, which uh, also Diana, of course, started, who I, I met about a year ago when she kindly spoke to us at the GRN and the Climate and Energy Think Tank, which I supervise, um, which is this issue of, of artistry and aesthetics being an important part of epistemic diversity in relating different groups in energy policy. I'm working with some artists uh, like the Austrian Petra Mait or the French Gantor Robillard, who for the last 20 years have tried to work with scientists and figure out how energy problems, ecological problems can be made uh, in, it translated in a way that people can experience what that means, whether it is algorithms that model environmental destruction in the ocean or the transformations that oceans undergo when energy projects like, like uh, offshore wind parks are introduced to this environment and have visual components or haptically available components for audiences to help people understand, but also give feedback to the scientists, what is really going on there. And I think this is a question of methodology as well, because wherever we are in, in, the, in the academia, we have methods and we have theories and they differ from discipline to discipline, but the way that we get from how we think to how we do, this translation that is a process we all are undergoing and there's a big aesthetic component and that is a basis through which we can communicate that there are aesthetic elements to it there are effective and embodied you know real physical feelable elements to it 
And those can enable a communication among different disciplines, whether it's uh, social scientists or engineers, as well as with decision makers in policy and the public. So that is perhaps a very mundane seeming intervention, but I do think just like Clark and Diana, that there is a real opportunity here, which we cannot, but must stress. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alex, for bringing this aspect that complements the idea of how the artistic part can actually bring the bridge between how do we think to how do we act. Tula, the floor is yours. Thank you. I agree completely on the importance of arts and design uh, in uh, visualizing the kind of uh, processes and effects that we are seeking after. Before becoming president of EVA, I was actually president of the Alta University in Finland, where we merged three universities in technology, business and art and design. And the absolutely uh, largest impact of this merger was that we were able to integrate arts and design into the communication, into the visualization, into the design of different kinds of processes where engineering or business models and things like that can make into the society. The other thing that uh, I think Thomas was taking up, you know, is this uh, differences in languages between the different uh, sectors in society and also between the different disciplines. And I think that, you know, the key to solving this challenge is participation. And that is why I think that, you know, the science and engineering academies have quite an important role because they are providing platforms from learning together, learning from each other uh, in order to explain and understand how scientific facts are generated in different fields and how they together can lead to effective policy decisions so, so that we can reach these societal contracts, you know, but both uh, learning together uh, uh, creating these platforms for interactions and participation and increasing the role of, of art and design into these processes. I think these are, these are important ways forward. Thanks a lot, Tula, for complimenting also on the role of the different organizations like the, the academies for, for helping with the participation of different actors. Um, we have another, another audience member. Uh, so, uh, Catherine, do you want to take the floor, introduce yourself, uh, and, and give uh, your intervention in this conversation. Thank you, everyone. Um, so my name is Katri mackinen rostad and I'm a PhD candidate of international politics and have been working before many years at the Council of Finnish Academies. So, for example, Tula is very, uh, very familiar to me. I'm currently working with a project that has collected some longitudinal data on IPES experts' views on knowledge and uh, their value changes. And just wanted to share with you something that we have noticed about uh, interdisciplinarity and epistemic diversity. So there are very much different ways of uh, how experts think um, how knowledge should be validated and how we create knowledge and how knowledge is actually put into action. And we constantly think that this follows disciplinary borders. But actually what we noticed is that this kind of epistemological thinking and how do you think that uh, knowledge should be validated, it just doesn't actually follow disciplines. So social scientists can't be kind of um, uh, classified as positivist as well. So it's not just this assumption that engineers think in that way. So that was quite an um, interesting uh, thing to notice. And we try to follow in this project, whether working in interdisciplinary ways, that whether it changes experts' way of thinking. And we also noticed, going back a bit, what Tula said about organizational roles, that it's a huge learning exercise for, for experts themselves as well to learn this kind of reflexive way of thinking. And um, what Diana said, uh, used the word of humility in epistemic ways. So it's this capacity building is, is really important as well. And also noticing that these organizations like IPCC and IPES, they have their own epistemologies as well, and they socialize experts to certain ways as well. So, Thanks a lot, Katri, for bringing this aspect also of how the experts engaging in these interdisciplinary platforms actually build their capacity and even evolve themselves in their ways of approaching uh, the issues they are um, exploring. I think, uh, Christian, actually, maybe that's a good topic to jump to you. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. So I'm really enjoying this conversation. So rather than just reiterating and sharing my, I guess, agreement much of what's been said, I just want to add another point to the discussion. And I think that's relating to evidence and what, what we consider as evidence. So because if we are to have truly interdisciplinary discussions, we are to need to think about what sort of evidence are different disciplines supplying and what are the underlying assumptions for that evidence? And also, what does that evidence mean? So I can share personally from having tried to sort of study behavioral science or behavior change. And having conversations with people doing integrated assessment models who mostly come from like trying to integrate new classical economics into more complex climatic biophysical systems. And because the evidence that we create, say, in psychology is not easily integratable into an integrated assessment model because what we consider evidence don't fit neatly into an equation. So how do we think about the evidence that we, or it could be a sociologist, anthropologist, what they create as evidence, how do we then still integrate that into making some sort of policy recommendations? And that also uh, sort of involves combating different assumptions about what goes into the models, for example, being explicit about it and being explicit about the limitations of those assumptions. And I think that's a critical step in terms of also broadening the scope of uh, solutions or initiatives to tackle like climate change or the energy uh, transformation. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Christian. Very interesting question of, of the difference in what we call evidence, depending on where we come from, being in disciplines, but also being from policy or from other parts of the society. J Jacopo, you wanted to add a little bit, and then I think Diana wants to uh, jump in the conversation. Based on what Christian said on evidence, I, I, I can't agree more. Um, there are uh, disciplines which come with uh, a certain ease uh, to feed into evidence for, for policy, okay? And uh, um, I think I made the example initially of, um, you know, um, behavior, um, behavioral economics. Um, I think we, we need to look at how our impact assessment system, our cost-benefit analysis, how they're designed to, in a sense, call for evidence um, and call for those numbers. And then there are other disciplines, um, and I made the example of uh, social practice theory uh, from sociology um, and anthropology, where it becomes harder to give those hard numbers. And I've had these conversations with um, energy policy makers for a few years, where they say, well, it's all very well, we hear all those other disciplines and all those other angles, but we cannot be as holistic unless we have some some numbers for our impact assessments and so I just I just really relate to what Christian just said yeah that it's a very uh, like down to the earth sometimes comment that you get back when you you go on this discussion with policymakers Diana you want you want to uh, jump in Thank you. Yes, it's a fascinating discussion. So I just want to offer the point of the importance of also epistemic democracy, so that um, we should try to treat each of the contributing uh, disciplines mutually uh, fertilizing rather than one serving the other. And I think we very unconsciously uh, don't do this yet. So we think we are very diverse and we are, think we are very inclusive, but in the end, very often, for example, the social sciences are there only to serve, to support the engineering or the economics uh, or the science. And, and one example is, and this is very unconscious, but often we, we invite the social scientists only to say, okay, here is our perfect technologies and here are these stupid people who don't want to take up our wonderful technologies so how can we make them uh, accepted so but uh, instead asking vice versa let's ask the social scientists what technologies people want and and how how people in general relate to technologies and us engineers trying to approach this with more humility and perhaps adopt to this because i think without uh, being uh, applying this more humility we, we are failing often and the same a bit with arts and 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 i'm by no means criticized too though because i did exactly Exactly the same, um, but last uh, just last week I was in arts workshop and I was the scientist invitee, and then I I also said you know it, it's really great that finally we're working with arts and you can translate our fant fantastic science I didn't say fantastic but our messages to arts and and get closer it closer to people's hearts. But then the artist said yeah, but it, shouldn't it be the other way around or the both ways to mutually? Why don't scientists also want to learn from arts and we can learn from them as well because and and what I was uh, referring 
to that because people don't only decide by rationale and by, by science, but by their feelings. And perhaps we can also benefit from understanding better the feelings and that uh, artists do better. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Diana. The, the, the two ways, um, not, not just calling up for helping at why are you, aren't you translating what we want into something that can ha help. Um, I don't know, uh, Clark or, or Tula, if you want to react to this aspect from your perspective. Clark has yeah, no, ab absolutely. You know, the, the experience that we've had is, is in a couple of uh, books that we've recently produced on the future of solar energy and uh, the kinds of societies that we might build around uh, solar energy. And, and it, the absolutely crucial to those processes was that we put together multidisciplinary teams with uh, writers and artists and social scientists and engineers. And together, they worked over a period of two days, each team, to imagine a future world given a certain set of inputs into the kinds of technologies that would be uh, available in that world. And then to imagine the kinds of people uh, who would live in those, those future worlds and then to collaborate on uh, building storylines, uh, which then what we ask each of the participants to do is then to write a story Uh, develop their art or offer some sort of technical or social commentary. Uh, and so each person brings their own disciplinary ex experience, but the interdisciplinary dialogues and, and learning that happens at the beginning then informs back into each of the different experiences. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Clark. Uh, Tula, maybe to reflect a bit on these uh, interventions, and then we have an uh, audience member who just joined us. So. Yeah, just a, just a short comment, you know, I, it was not my intention to say that, you know, the, 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 the this discussion we had so many times in Alto that, you know, artists are not visualizing uh, what already is. Uh, and, and one of our movie directors actually said that there are two different ways of learning in society. One is by facts and science, and the other one is by experience. And, and, and the thing is that, you know, the, these kind of uh, interventions, you know, and, and, and collaborations with the, with the artist can give a deeper understanding of things which appeal to people better than our Excel tables, you know, uh, which is by narrative. And that's what I mean, that there is a strength in the artist's way of communication, which is more appealing, more easy to understand for people that are not in science. But mm -hmm. it is very important, you know, that, that it goes both ways and, and, and that you have this interdisciplinary humility, you know, that you, you understand that the artists and the uh, designers are not there to explain you, but they have powerful tools uh, for doing so and, and also an essential part of the learning process. So I, I agree completely. Thank you, Tula. Um, we are welcoming now someone from the audience before I give the floor to uh, Jeannie and, and Thomas. Uh, could you introduce yourself uh, and, and give the intervention Yvonne. Yeah, I will be brief. Uh, I'm no longer working in energy, but seven years ago, I was the main analyst for the review of the Quebec energy policy. For those who are not, Quebec is a province of Canada, so we have about 8 million population, and we are some quite the largest uh, electricity consumer in the world. And our electricity has no carbon content because it's come out by a very large hydro dam in North. And it's make us in a very different place than the rest of the world as an energy policy, uh, because uh, everything we try, we do on the other side of the planet, where does not work here. And when we, we work on the policy, that was our main problem, because uh, we are all those, and actually the, my experience is the opposite. The politicians listen a lot to people in social science, especially political scientists. But from the engineering and the economic point of view, what was proposed originally didn't make any sense. Uh, for various reasons, uh, Quebecers are very proud of their large dam in the north, which is a historical success story for the society. But in two days, they are, they are an economic burden. Building new dams is ecological and economic burden. And he, there has been politicians making idea of a picking your app of electricity and selling to the United States. But if you do basic economic analysis, this too is an error. An error. You will losing money when selling to the United States if you build new dam. If you have excess money, we can we will leave it. But otherwise, it's, and we have those, these very technical things that destroy the 
magnificent idea <laughs> generated by the politician. And we have to fight against that. And I also would like to comment about usage of social science in other fields by engineer. Uh, actually, it's mandatory in Canada and in the practical guide of practice of engineering, you have to use every kind of knowledge you could before starting a project. You have to check the ethics, you have to check the environment, you have to check the social impact. The problem is many knowledge from the other field are not actionable. Okay, give you information, but can you use it to make a, cho a choice? We, we, there are a lot of things you know. If you build something, create pollution, but you can calculate somehow the pollution impact. But social impact is very difficult to integrate in a way. You can reduce noise level to a level what is less annoying. But uh, we had this issue with the windmill. Uh, windmill, you can control the noise level. You can do a lot of things, but they still annoy people because mm -hmm. it's sight. It has nothing to do with biology or physics. Yeah, there it's is a challenge. Uh, yeah, yeah. And actionable and, knowledge from other disciplines is, is something that's difficult to integrate with uh, the, the the assessments. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, exactly. Thanks a lot, uh, Yvonne, for joining this conversation. Jenny, do you want to jump in and and also take up some of those comments we had from Yvonne and from? Yes, yeah. So I was gonna just follow up on um, related to the point that uh, was just made, um, but also going back to Diana's uh, idea of democratizing the disciplines and not having a hierarchy of disciplines, and and this idea of humility and you know there's an arrogance among many scientists that they know, and if everyone else just understood what they know, then you know, the energy and climate problems of the world would be solved, um, which is really unfortunate and I think unproductive and it actually slows us down <laughs> with the urgency. So I wanted to also just acknowledge um, this idea of energy democracy, which sees the transformation in energy systems as an opportunity that, yes, it will help with climate but there are so many other reasons to move away from fossil fuels toward a re more renewable based future that have nothing to do with greenhouse gas emissions or decarbonization. So I think there's there's this opportunity that we get lost sometimes when we focus on the science of climate as a justification for energy and focus only on decarbonization and greenhouse gas emission accounting and all of that. And we miss so much. Um, so I just also want to highlight how important it is to think about the opportunity of this huge transformation that we're in the process of and how we can redistribute power literally and figuratively. There's social, there's economic and political implications and opportunities to invest in communities um, in whole new ways that we just haven't done and, and are actually desperately needed. Um, so connecting energy with health and food and housing and uh, jobs and fundamental economic prosperity for everyone is such an opportunity that some of the science that we think of in these narrow terms just isn't working on and isn't making these connections. So we also need to reframe uh, some of the processes for integrating science into policy because the conventional approaches are insufficient. Thanks a lot, Jeannie, for also triggering some more thinking of the big picture and, and beyond the usual uh, silos of thinking. Um, I have Thomas, and then we'll, we'll finish with uh, an audience member who just joined hither. Thank you. Uh, so I very much agree with what Jenny just said, and also uh, about uh, uh, this epistemic uh, democracy by, by Diana. So it's not always easy to convey messages about social factors in a field that is uh, arguably dominated by techno-economic types of analysis. I feel that the human dimension is often overlooked when we talk about energy policy. And there is uh, often a kind of instrumental approach to, to social sciences when, when it comes to energy policy. And so that re resonates very much with what Diana said about um, yeah, using social sciences to advance the social acceptance of uh, specific technology and uh, viewing energy communities, for example, as 
uh, as as a tool to to uh, enhance the efficiency of energy flows in in, in, in grids or uh, as a way to uh, enhance social acceptance of, of a certain technology while energy communities could question are indeed institutional opportunities for uh, questioning the social relations around energy systems they could be true laboratories for citizen participation and, and spaces to prefigure alternative energy systems. So I very much uh, agree uh, with Jenny on, on this. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Uh, finally, in the last part of our, our conversation, Heather uh, from the audience, do, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and have a, a brief uh, intervention on, on uh, what you want to bring to the conversation? So I'm a philosopher of science that has also been following and working on energy policy, including public uh, participation in energy policy decisions uh, for the past few years. And I wanted to just point out a tension between the sort of desire for complexity and detail that experts love to get into in the modeling and the way in which when you actually engage with say multidisciplinary teams that Clark was talking about or the sort of energy democracy that Jenny was pointing to, you usually need to make some kind of simplifying assumptions um, to get the thing going or how to move away from sort of the desire to get all the complexities in, I think is a really big challenge for democratic practice. Um, and I have colleagues who work on participatory modeling where they actually bring in members of the public to help make assumptions about models I have done energy planning exercises where we take all the energy for a system and convert it all to gigajoules and then worry about changing it out uh, at one gigajoule levels with energy efficiency or um, energy transformation to electrification or non-greenhouse gas systems to try to get at things that people can work with without you know, the full complexity of our disciplines, which we almost never bring to a fully transdisciplinary context. So um, just making life a little more complicated. For well, at the same time, Heather, it's, it's a nice way to also finish for catalyzing even more conversation within this group or within some other uh, communities. We're reaching the end of the fish bowl. I think everyone can take a deep breath now <laughs> after this sprint through this conversation. Uh, I'm going to pass it now for maybe what they have, you know, the Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learned societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. SAPEA is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 programme for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elizaveta Sushchenko. So I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now.